Okay, so last time we uh, concluded talking about much of the angiosperm diversity, but uh, I didn't get a chance to get through the last of the differences that uh, distinguish, easily distinguish the two major groups of angiosperms, the eudicots and the monocots. And this is important because in talking about seed germination afterwards, there's some major differences there. And also with regard to um, the structure and growth of, of angiosperms, the eudicots and the monocots differ pretty dramatically in really interesting ways. So this isn't just a completely esoteric um, discussion about the, the, two, the distinction between these two major groups of flowering plants. And so today we're going to move from talking about diversity in general and start talking about the structure and function of plants and um, really the elegant uh, anatomy and morphology of plants and the way, ways in which they grow, which are um, pretty, stereot or pretty, pretty conserved across uh, the groups of flowering plants, as well as in other cases, uh, uh, other, other uh, vascular plants. And it's, uh, they follow some basic rules, which are really elegant and, and uh, fairly easy to understand, although you have to keep sort of a three-dimensional perspective as we go through this. Okay, so last time I went through these few characters here that distinguish monocots on the left from eudicots on the right. Um, the single cotyledon, of course, the basis of the name here, in monocots, which is the derived feature, this single embryonic leaf, and I'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, and then two cotyledons, or two embryonic leaves in eudicots, uh, which is ancestral in flowering plants, the monocot condition being derived. As far as uh, leaf venation goes, the leaves are, um, have the veins oriented in this parallel pattern, typically in monocots, which is a derived feature, you know, uh, versus in eudicots, we have more of a net-like uh, openly branching sort of venation pattern, which is something ancestral in angiosperms. And we're going to get into the stem anatomy a lot more, but I'll just mention again the vascular tissue, uh, the conducting tissue that transports water and sugars through the plant. Um, in angiosperms and uh, in general, the, the xylem and phloem, which we're going to talk about, is in these little bundles that run through the stems, but in monocots, the bundles are scattered through the stem. This is a cross section. And you can see how the bundles run down the stem here. In eudicots, though, the vascular bundles are arranged in a ring. And this is really important when we get to talking about how uh, wood and bark are formed in plants that, in woody plants that undergo secondary growth but more on that in a minute. Um, the last features here that we didn't have a chance to get through entirely, monocots have a fibrous root system typically, um, and that's because their tap root, which is the root that forms from the embryonic root, the, main, the, the sole root in the embryo, um, it doesn't persist. It grows for a while, and then it's replaced by adventitious roots and these are just roots that are formed from, a, from the base of the stem. Anything that's adventitious in plants is basically uh, a structure that's formed from some place other than its normal origin. So roots don't normally form from the sides of stems, but that's what happens in monocots. And you end up with a, a pretty diffuse root system, like you get in grasses, often pretty shallow. Whereas in eudicots, like in other seed plants, you get a, a tap root that uh, is the embryonic root that persists through the life of the plant, and it's the dominant root from which lateral roots are formed. And these can have very deep root systems. Um, pollen differs fundamentally between monocots and eudicots. In the monocots, we have the ancestral condition of just one opening in the pollen grain that allows the pollen tube to emerge. And that's what we also see in the gymnosperms. But in the eudicots, we have three openings, which is a derived condition. Um, they can either be slits or pores. But, um, and sometimes you'll get 
pollen that has additional openings too in the eudicots, but at least three. And that helps to recognize eudicots in the fossil record because um, no other plant produces pollen like that except the eudicots. And then in terms of just uh, the flower organization, in monocots, the flower uh, parts are usually in multiples of three. And that actually um, is what we also see in some of the magnoliids and some of these early diverging lineages of flowering plants that are outside of both of these groups. So this is the ancestral condition in flowering plants or close to it. Whereas in the eudicots, the flower parts like the petals and the sepals, stamens, carpels, they're in multiples of four or five. So you typically have four or five petals, four or five sepals. That's something you don't see um, typically outside the eudicots. So there are a lot of ways you can tell these groups apart that are pretty reliable. So the question of why angiosperm diversity is so high, um, you know, far outstripping that of all the other seed plants and really the land plants taken together is sort of an open question. We've just reviewed all of these different features that differentiate angiosperms from other seed plants. Um, they're reduced gametophytes, the double fertilization, the flower with its ovary, um, the fruit. There's a bunch of features there that uh, distinguish them, but one intriguing uh, possibility that might explain a lot of the diversity is the fact that they've undergone so much coevolutionary change with other organisms in regards to pollination and dispersal that we talked about, as well as um, with herbivores that uh, has led to really rich secondary chemistry. There's a lot of, there's some evidence now from looking at groups, uh, there's so many groups of angiosperms that you can do interesting comparisons across traits and some of the floral specialization that I mentioned last time, for example, bilateral symmetry of flowers, uh, traits like that seem to be associated with bursts of diversification. So it really does appear that um, to some extent, the coevolution of flowering plants with animals and other organisms has uh, in part led to this increased specialization and increased diversification. And in fact, of course, there's so many flowering plants that we don't really know how many there are. They're being discovered and described faster or at a slower pace, unfortunately, than they're going extinct. They're still being dis dis discovered at a very fast pace, but especially down in the tropics, the rate of deforestation and um, loss of flowering plant diversity is so high that there's a real race against time for botanists to try to describe and, um, well, to discover and describe and try to protect some of this diversity and characterize it in terms of its ecological importance and its economic, potential economic importance. Uh, because much of our, f most of our food our uh, medicine, a lot of our medicines, our wood products, and in some cultures, our, their fuel is really um, crucially dependent on angiosperm diversity. And so this is something that we um, really have to take seriously and try to invest more in. Um, and actually, those same, some, some of those same challenges actually exist in the temperate parts of the world too, like here in California, where the the herbarium that I curate downstairs, um, we're discovering and describing new plant species endemic to California all the time. And some of these are found in proximity to highways, things that have never been collected before. Um, this is a biodiversity hotspot right here that's in grave jeopardy in terms of the rate at which it's being um, altered. And with climate change and all, we've got our work cut out for us even in the nearby vicinity here. Okay, so seed morphology um, is something that I want to introduce now because we're going to get into the growth and development of plants. And of course, as far as the sporophyte goes, this is where it starts. And this segues right from what we were talking about with the um, development of the seed and some of the distinctions between uh, eudicots and monocots are seen at this in regards to seed germination. So um, getting back to the angiosperm life cycle, the end, the end of it here with regard to the formation of the seed, remember that the endosperm is the nutritive tissue formed from the fusion of one of the sperm with the polar nuclei of the central cell of the female gametophyte. 
And the important thing, as I mentioned, is that the angiosperms wait to invest in that nutritive tissue for the embryo until after fertilization is assured, rather than in the gymnosperms where they make the investment before fertilization, which can potentially result in wastage of resources. Um, and actually, the endosperm begins to develop really before we have um, the embryo start to develop from the zygote. So the endosperm gets a head start developmentally, even though the fertilization and the double fertilization events occur more or less simultaneously. And we eventually get this embryo forming that uh, has these embryonic leaves, the cotyledons, as well as an embryonic shoot tip and an embryonic root. So the, the two major embryonic regions of the flowering plant, uh, the shoot apex and the root apex, are already present in the, in the embryo at that stage. And so the plant has really everything it needs for development, as we'll see shortly. And as the seed reaches maturity, it undergoes massive dehydration down to 5 to 15 percent water by weight. And as that happens, it enters what's called dormancy, which is a situation where the met metabolism of the seed almost ceases. So it's almost indetectable, the amount of metabolism going on here. And of course, this is a feature that allows seed plants to potentially persist in a seed bank for decades, maybe hundreds of years. Um, some of our fire followers here in California that only germinate after fires um, have gone well over 100 years between fires, uh, between um, germination events. So seeds have a great way of being able to persist, keep a angiosperm basically uh, alive during periods that are not very conducive to, to survival. Okay, so here's a major distinction between the seeds of, of some eudicots at least and some monocots. These are sort of extremes that demonstrate some of the variation we see in the seed. Uh, and some eudicots, the example here being a bean, the endosperm doesn't persist. The embryo absorbs the endosperm and stores the nutrients of the endosperm inside the cotyledons those embryonic leaves. So when you eat a bean or a pea, uh, the bulk of the tissue there that you're eating are the two cotyledons. And if you carefully pull these apart in the right orientation, you can see the two cotyledons here, the two halves of the bean. And they're attached to a, a little miniature plant axis here, which is um, the, above the point of attachment of the cotyledons is the shoot apex. Um, what we call the epicotyl in the seed, which is basically just means over the cotyledons, the part of, above the point of attachment of the cotyledons where we have, here you can see the first two foliage leaves, not the embryonic leaves, but the two first foliage leaves, which in a bean are already formed in the seed, but in some eudicots they only form it during germination. Um, and then below the point of attachment of the cotyledons, we have what's called the hypocotyl, which is just means below the cotyledons, the part of the, sh of the um, stem, the embryonic stem that's below that point. And then the radical is just the embryonic root, the embryonic tap root, which uh, attaches to the hypocotyl. And you can't see it very well there, but we have a little miniature plant axis here with these gargantuan cotyledons attached to it. Okay, so in the monocots, like the grasses, and this includes all of our grains, like wheat and rye, uh, rice, but this example is corn. This is a corn kernel here, a corn fruit. Um, the, the grasses retain most of the endosperm inside the seed until germination, and then they absorb the endosperm through the cotyledon, which is the shield-like structure right here, so the cotyledon, there's just one of them in monocots, remember. It's uh, basically, uh, uh, it basically is a shield-shaped uh, object that uh, absorbs the endosperm, making it available to the rest of the embryo, which is on the other side of the cotyledon right here. 
And so um, with this partitioning of the endosperm from the embryo, it's easy to mill grain and remove the endosperm from the rest of the, the grass fruit. And this isn't just the seed, actually. This is the entire fruit of a grass because the, the fruit wall is fused to the, the seed here. So this yellow part, this thick part here, is the, actually the fruit wall, the ovary wall in a grain. And um, that's what we call commercially the bran. You've heard of the bran, the roughage or fiber content of whole grain. Um, that's milled away from the endosperm, and so is the embryo, which is referred to as the germ, the germ in uh, commercial terms. So refined grain is just endosperm, so something like white rice or white wheat flour is just endosperm. Uh, the endosperm is also the white fluffy substance of popcorn. Um, and uh, so the endosperm is relatively lacking in nutrition compared to the embryo, where there's a lot more investment of resources and so that's uh, in part why, in addition to the roughage provided by the bran or the fruit wall, that whole grain is more healthy than refined grain. In any case, that's the general layout there in terms of um, a eudicot and a, and a monocot seed. So seed plants have a number of innovations that promote uh, optimal timing for germination. And this is really important because the establishment of a seedling at the seed stage when it's undergoing germination, that's the period of highest mortality. That's the most vulnerable stage in the life of a plant. So if you look at a mortality curve for plants, the mortality peak is right during the establishment of the seedling when it has to get a root system down um, to con in contact with moisture so it can draw water up into the plant, which is exposed to the, the, most of the plant, the upper, the uh, shoot system is exposed to the atmosphere. Um, we also have to get the plant up into the light, so the shoot up into the light so it can actually start producing food from light and carbon dioxide. So it's that period of time that plants are in really major jeopardy to get established in this land environment. And so the timing, the cues that stimulate germination very widely across plants. Even really closely related wild plants can have really different cues for germination. And they're often complex, but they can involve things like light. You know, some small seeded plants might need light to germinate. Um, that makes sense because they need to be close to the surface in order to successfully germinate. Um, they might need a cold period that simulates winter so that um, they don't accidentally germinate too soon and are killed by frost uh, or by, um, yeah, potentially by frost or in some parts of the world, uh, insufficient light to be successful. And they might need chemical cues like are required from passing through the gut of an animal or from uh, f smoke or, or charcoal in the, in the case of fire followers. And there might be combinations of those cues that are necessary in addition to the presence of abundant moisture. So moisture alone doesn't necessarily result in germination. Our crop plants have been selected to germinate um, readily. And so they're not a very good um, gauge of how diverse plants are in terms of their, um, their adaptations to different kinds of cues for germination. So in the process of germination, what basically happens is that the seed um, starts after it's, after it's been stimulated to germinate, which can be a hormonal response. We have water starts to be absorbed by the seed. It starts to resume metabolic activity. And as it swells, it ruptures the seed coat. And then we get the emergence of the seedling. And uh, this happens in two very different ways in the eudicots and the monocots that I just mentioned. So um, in the eudicots, the, like the beans, what we see is, first of all, the, um, in both the eudicots and the monocots, we have the emergence of the, the root. So the roots emerge first, and they have positive geotropism, which means that Basically, they grow with gravity, and this is a hormonally induced response that results in the root growing down into the soil. 
the taproot grows quickly in both the monocots and the eudicots. They start producing root hairs, which increase the surface area of the root. And you'll see that in the video in a second. But these root hairs are, hairs are just epidermal outgrowths that uh, increase the surface area from which they can absorb water and, new, and minerals. And um, in the case of the monocots, as I mentioned, the taproot doesn't survive very long. But we start getting these adventitious roots forming from the base of the shoot that, that uh, create the fibrous root system. So after the root system is actually pretty well established, only then does the shoot start to emerge from the seed, or start to emerge from the ground, I should say. And the first um, thing that we see happening in the eudicots that are um, similar to the bean here is that the hypocotyl, that region below the attachment of the cotyledons, the lower part of the embryonic stem, it starts to uh, grow up uh, with negative geotropism, growing against gravity. And as it emerges, it forms this germination hook that you can see here. And so by doing that, by having the hypocotyl rather than the other parts of the shoot respond to, um, uh, to, to be the leading edge of the growth, this pulls the cotyledons and the protected shoot apex through the soil. Shoot apex is shielded between these cotyledons. And so we don't have the abrasion potentially damaging the uh, cotyledons, which are going to be the important for initial photosynthesis food production, and the shoot apex, which is, as we'll point out, is the critical thing to protect because that's where your embryonic tissue is that's going to result in the further growth of the stem. So you pull the cotyledons and the shoot apex up this way. After full emergence, the whole thing straightens out, um, and we get the, the uh, greening up of the cotyledons. The, the expansion of the first foliage leaves and the elongation of the stem that we'll talk about in a minute. OK, now contrast this with what goes on in the monocots, where you have, um, we already talked about the root system getting established. But here, there's a, a sheath called the coleoptile that doesn't have a homolog in the eudicots. It's basically a sheath, a hollow sheath that um, surrounds the shoot apex or the uh, the shoot apex of the of the um, of the of the embryo and it grows straight up there's no germination hook here it grows straight up and as, as soon as it emerges from the soil the uh, the shoot emerges through that sheath and so it's been protected from the abrasion of the soil from emergence here and then it um, undergoes um, expansion of the leaves and elongation of the shoot. So in this case, the seed and the, actually the whole fruit remains underground, whereas here you can see that the seed emerges from the ground, although the seed coat is sloughed off as it's pulled through, or in the course of the breaking open of the, the spreading of the cotyledons, the seed coat is further ruptured. Whereas here, the seed and the fruit remain underground, as does the, as does the um, cotyledon. So it has a really different sort of development in the case of, of eudicots and monocots. And so now we're going to look at this process in video. And so you'll see these steps. We're going to first look at, the, at a bean emerging. So you can see here the roots starting to form. And the, these are the root hairs on the tap root. So we have rapid growth. And now that, that happened quickly, but you can see the germination um, hook and it formed, the thing straightened out. Here are the cotyledons. You can see the two cotyledons expanded. And now the shoot apex here, the epicotyl, will start to grow. Over here, you can see it better, where we have the first foliage leaves now that have emerged. And well, on its way. You can see here that uh, the seed coat's left underground, or in some cases, it's left clinging to the, to the plant. Whereas in the monocot, in the corn, we also get the root system established quickly. 
And here we have the coleoptile going straight up. There's no germination hook here. And as soon as it emerges, the shoot, the shoot comes out of the coleoptile. And um, we get the development of a seedling here. You can see here the adventitious roots starting to form from the um, base of the stem. And so the seeds, I don't know if you noticed it, but the, the, the corn uh, fruits remained underground there. They didn't emerge. Okay, so that's the, the germination process. And now we're going to start to look at, are there questions about this? Yeah. It does have a taproot initially, right? Yeah, it does. And it lives for a while. It was living through that whole part of the video we saw there. And you, you could start to see the development of those adventitious roots, but the taproot wouldn't persist in, indefinitely. Yeah, good point. Yeah. What happens to the Oh, the cotyledons, good question. The cotyledons don't persist for very long. As soon as the fo first foliage leaves get established, they can hang on for quite a while, but eventually they'll drop off. Yeah, after the reserves are exhausted in them. Um, but they also function in photosynthesis, you saw. They green up as well, but uh, they don't persist too long. Okay, so um, we're going to start now looking um, at, the, at the growth and development of the plant body. And before we can really do that, we need to talk about cell and tissue types in plants. And there's some really distinct cell and tissue types that um, we see repeated over and over again in, in different uh, plant organs. So the first uh, type of cell that we're going to talk about are, is parenchyma. And parenchyma is um, a cell type that's good to start out with because these are the most metabolically active cells in the plant. These are the cells that undergo photosynthesis responsible for storage of food, for example. And they have um, also the capability of continuing to divide and differentiate into other cell types if there's wounding of the plant. But at maturity, they're, they're typically not dividing. And they have very thin walls. You can see here the thin walls of a parenchyma cell that allows them some flexibility. So these cells can be fully mature in parts of the plant that are still growing. And they're flexible enough to um, conform to that. So that's a major cell type within the plant body in general. Another type is uh, cholenchyma. And cholenchyma, like parenchyma, these are cells that are living at functional maturity, which may sound a little bizarre because what isn't everything living when it's mature, but actually some of these cell types we're going to be talking about right away are not living at functional maturity. That is when they actually are functionally active for the, or when they actually serve a function for the plant. But cholenchyma cells um, have very th have unevenly thickened walls. You can see all this dark staining area. These are cross sections, by the way. Um, so you can see these, that the walls are thickened unevenly here, which gives them some rigidity and strength. So this type of cell can impart some structural support. But these, these um, cell walls are just primary walls. We'll get to secondary walls in a minute. But primary walls retain some flexibility. So even though these have some structural, um, can provide some structural support, they also have flexibility can, and can occur in growing parts of the plant. So they can, can um, provide support in growing areas. And we often find these kinds of cells just inside the epidermis, the outermost layer of cells on a plant, and especially in the primary plant body, which we'll get to, we'll get to that in a minute. So um, an example, Let's see, for example, first, first of all, for parenchyma, I should mention that these are cells that are widely found throughout the plant body. They're much of the soft tissue in a plant. So if you eat a fruit, for example, a lot of that tissue is parenchyma. Whereas cholenchyma, what you might be familiar with there is if you bite into a stalk of celery, the strings that can get caught between your teeth 
in, those, uh, in a, stem, in a uh, stalk of celery, which is a petiole of a, of a celery leaf, um, that's Kalenkema. So if you've pulled those out of your teeth, you'll notice that they're green. They're living cells, and they're, they do provide some structural support, as you can appreciate. They're pretty, star- pretty strong. So a third tissue type, or third cell type, is sclerenchyma. And sclerenchyma cells are dead at functional maturity. So when they're fully formed, the protoplast dies, and they become hollowed out. And um, they lay, before they die, they lay down secondary wall between the primary wall and the cell membrane. And these secondary walls are not only adding thickness to the cell wall, but they also are impregnated with lignin, which is a compound that imparts rigidity to plant parts. And so examples of sclerenchyma are things like, uh, well, there are a couple of different types of sclerenchyma. There, there are sclerids, which are not elongated cells, but uh, provide so structural support. For example, the seed coat, rigid seed coats are made of these really tough sclerids, as is, uh, say, the um, outer fruit wall of a nut, you know, like a walnut shell, something like that. Those, uh, that, those are sclerids that impart that hardness. Um, and if you bite into a pear, I don't know if you know, you've, you've um, experienced that sort of um, grittiness of a pear fruit. Those are sclerids inside the, um, the fruit of a pear, which is otherwise mostly parenchyma tissue, but there are sclerids in there that give it that gritty texture. Another type of sclerenchyma are fibers. Now, fibers are elongated um, cells that form thread-like, uh, they're often in a thread-like organization. And you might be familiar with fibers for like hemp fiber, which is used traditionally to make rope, or um, flax fiber, it's used for weaving. Um, fibers are really tough and, and um, impart rigidity to tissue, but these sclerenchyma cells are only formed in parts of the plant that have quit growing because sclerenchyma is uh, rigid and it can't elongate, it's inflexible. Okay, so only in the parts of the plant that are no longer growing is sclerenchyma fully differentiated. Are there questions about cell types? There are, other couple, there are a couple of other cell types in the vascular tissue, the conducting tissue, and we're gonna to get to those in a minute. But these are cell types that are found, found throughout all the tissues of the plant, not just the vascular tissue. Okay, so the, there are tissue systems in plants, and just like those, uh, well, there are more than those three cell types, but there are three tissue types. There are only three tissue types in plants. And tissues are just a functional unit that connects all the plant organs. Um, and there are three types of plant organs, um, regardless of whether we're talking about reproductive parts of the plant or vegetative parts of the plant. Plants are made up of leaves, stems, and roots. And remember, the flower is basically a a simple shoot that's that's a stem, the axis of it, with modified leaves, both sterile and and, uh, fertile, um, and stems and roots. And these all have characteristic um, attributes we'll talk about in a moment. And across across the leaves, the stem, and the root, we have three types of tissue systems that are known as dermal, ground, and vascular tissue. So the dermal tissue is the tissue that forms the outer protective covering of the plant. So the outermost layer, in the case of the primary plant body, just the epidermis, a single cell layer in thickness. When we get to secondary growth, it can be more than one layer in thickness. And then the vascular tissue in purple here is um, the conducting tissue, conducting water, and um, food, uh, sugars, and other organic nutrients. And the ground tissue in yellow here is basically everything else, mostly parenchyma, that um, is the most metabolically active tissue in the plant. And you can see how these three different types of tissue, with the exception of the epidermis, actually the 
vascular tissue and the, and the ground tissue are organized in different ways in the three different organs. So there's a very different organization, for example, the vascular tissue and the stem compared to the root and the ground tissue as well. And the same applies to the leaves, but it's all interconnected. It's all a unified whole. These tissue systems are all interconnected across these three organs, three types of organs. But we'll talk about the shoot system and the root system separately in terms of development because they are so different anatomically and developmentally. The same applies to the leaves, actually. So the dermal tissue, um, as I mentioned, this is just the outer protective covering of the plant body, which in the primary plant body, which is all there ever is in a monocot, uh, in most, almost all monocots, and in all non-woody eudicots, the dermal system is just the epidermis, a single cell layer in thickness around the outside of the entire plant. And it's typically um, covered with this waxy substance called the cuticle, or waxy uh, substance that constitutes the cuticle, which you can see is typically thicker on the outermost walls, the ones that are most exposed to the atmosphere, than on the inner walls. And this cuticle is critical, of course, to provide a barrier so that we don't have water loss from the plant out into the atmosphere. But the plants have to be able to take in gases, especially in particular CO2, in order for photosynthesis to occur. So there has to be, has to be a way for CO2 to get in. Uh, during photosynthesis, oxygen is generated, so some of the respiratory needs can be met by that oxygen. But sometimes oxygen needs to be um, taken in through the epidermis as well. And that's done through what are called, uh, what's called a stoma, which uh, the plural is stomata, uh, adding a TA to that, just referring to multiple stoma. And here you can see individual stoma here. And uh, these are the pores right here that allow air exchange with the outside of the plant. And these two, there's two cells here on either side here which are called guard cells that regulate the airflow. They regulate the size of that pore. They can completely close that pore if the plant's experiencing drought stress, for example, or they can open it widely, allowing maximum um, entry of, car of carbon dioxide. But the problem with having this open, of course, is that it's, it is a way that water can leave the plant. And so it's a trade-off that the plant's always juggling is getting enough CO2 into the plant for photosynthesis to occur, and in some cases, um, sufficient oxygen for respiration, but also not letting out too much water and causing the plant to wilt. So that's, uh, these are structures that we see um, on the epidermis of the plant, and especially on the leaves, and especially on the underside of the leaves of plants that have bifacial or flattened leaves where they're not in direct exposure to the sun and there's less potential for evaporative water loss. And also the epidermis can produce some extensions. So even though it's only a cell layer in thickness around the plant body, there can be epidermal cells that extend outside the, this layer and even multiple epidermal cells that can make up things like these hairs here you see. And we can have hairs on roots we can have hairs on stems, we can have hairs on leaves, and they serve a variety of function. Those root hairs that I mentioned earlier that are coming off the tap, that were coming off the tap root that you could see in that video, those are epidermal outgrowths. They're just extensions of the epidermal cells of the root, and they allow for an increased surface area for absorption to occur. And some of the epidermal hairs on the outside of the shoot system on the stems and the leaves those uh, hairs can function in a variety of ways. They can deter herbivores by producing toxic um, glandular exudates. Um, you often, maybe you felt sticky plant parts before that are producing um, glandular substances that are distasteful to herbivores or maybe even poisonous. They can also form a reflective layer if they're densely packed on the surface. Um, you've seen hair, leaves that are covered with white hairs that allow them to reflect light. 
So if they grow in a high light environment, reflecting light could be beneficial to keep the leaf from overheating. So there are things like that that the epidermis can serve to protect the plant body. There are questions about the dermal system. We're going to talk more about it soon. Okay, so now the vascular tissue um, involves some additional cell types in addition to parenchyma, collenchyma, and sclerenchyma that I mentioned before. Yeah, it's unfortunate names, but we're sort of stuck with those names. Um, the vascular tissue is of two types. And remember, these are the conducting tissues that transport water and nutrients in the plant. So there are just two discrete types of vascular tissue. There's the xylem, which conducts water and minerals through the plant. And uh, of course, from the roots, where the water is absorbed to the other parts. And the xylem has a couple of types of cells that we haven't seen yet, uh, namely tracheids on the right here and vessel elements here on the left. And like sclerenchyma, these are cells that are dead at functional maturity. So the protoplast dies and disappears. And these are basically hollow tubes that conduct water. And they're arranged together in a conducting system, basically a plumbing system through the plant. And tracheids are the type of conducting element in the xylem that's found across all vascular plants. And in fact, that's why the vascular plants are technically known as tracheophytes, which just means tracheid bearing plants. Because even though some mosses have conducting tissue, it's not homologous to tracheids. Um, now the tracheids and the vessel elements like the sclerenchyma are not only dead at functional maturity, but they have secondary walls that are laid down before the cell dies on top of the primary wall. So these thicken the walls, make them stronger. And again, like in sclerenchyma, the walls are impregnated with lignin, the strengthening substance that imparts a lot of strength to, the, to these particular types of cells. And that's really important for them to be able to withstand the kinds of pressures, negative pressures that they're under during uh, water conduction. The water moves between these tracheids, not by actually big openings between them, but by places in the tracheid where their secondary wall wasn't laid down and where there's just primary wall that's very thin. And that's what we call pits. And you can see pits along the side of the tracheid. There are also pits here along the side of the vessel element. And so water can move through these um, primary walls. There are small holes, very tiny holes in the primary wall. But um, you might think, well, that doesn't sound very efficient to have um, the water have to cross these membranes or try to cross, cross through these very small openings. But one of the functions of having, I mean, one of the benefits of having some uh, restriction to movement here is that it prevents air bubbles from moving through the conduction system. So if an air bubble forms inside of a tracheid, that's going to prevent conduction from continuing. And it's much more difficult for an air bubble to move through these small openings than it would be if there were large openings. So an embolism in uh, vascular tissue can have dire consequences for conduction and uh, tracheids have means of preventing these embolisms from spreading through the conducting tissue um, with regard to these pits. Now vessel elements have more potential for embolisms to spread, but they also have more efficient movement of water because they actually have perforation plates in the ends. You can see one right here in a bleak view. So that's actually, um, there are actually openings, these perforation um, plates um, have openings that are not covered by primary wall. There's no wall there at all. And so the ends of vessel elements have pretty free movement between them. And together, they make up what's called the vessels. So these things are hooked together end to end and provide for very efficient water movement. But under severe drought stress, these are more prone to forming air for air bubbles to really uh, move through the system and 
um, cause, cause a uh, problem. So we can get both vessel elements and tracheary, uh, tracheids within angiosperm wood or angiosperm xylem. Yeah. Um, well, the tracheids uh, both serve a structural function as well as a conduction function. In general, they're, they're narrower, they're more tightly packed in the tissue, and so they impart some more rigidity to the, uh, to the conducting tissue than the vessels do. The vessels are usually found in association with fibers, the type of sclerenchyma I mentioned. And so we have, in the cases of plants that have vessel elements, they often have a mixture of fibers and vessels, the fibers serving a more of a structural function and the vessels serving more of a conduction function within the vascular tissue. So more of a separation of function than we see in some plants that just have tracheids. And so vessel elements are only found in angiosperms and in the neophytes, those weird, weird things like the platypus of the plant kingdom I mentioned, the Welwitchia. Um, and it used to be the reason that people thought the neophytes and the angiosperms, one of the reasons that they were thought to be closely related, but they've independently evolved vessels. Um, vessels are, are not found very widely outside of those two groups, the flowering plants and the neophytes. Um, although they're continuing to be um, discovered in some other groups, but for example, conifers lack them altogether and just have tracheids. Okay, the other type of conducting tissue is the phloem. And the phloem conducts the, the food through the plant, the sugar and organic nutrients. And we'll talk about exactly how that happens soon, as well as how the water moves through the plant. But in terms of the cell types that make up the phloem, there are two major cell types that you need to uh, realize. Uh, one is the sieve tube element, which is the type of element that actually conducts the, the, uh, the sugar solution through the plant. And these are living at maturity, but the bulk of this elongate cell is open in the center because the cytoplasm is just restricted to a little uh, layer around the inside, uh, just inside the wall of the, of the, of the cell and it's lost the nuclei, it lost the ribosomes, it's lost the vacuoles, it's lost all the organelles, including the nuclei, which allows the cytoplasm to take up a very small amount of space just around the periphery of the inside of this um, sieve tube element. Um, and so it allows the, the center of this element to mostly be open for conduction. And these sieve tube elements are joined end to end with one another into sieve tubes and between the sieve tubes, we have what's called a sieve plate that has openings in it that allow the sugar water to move through the plant. Um, this is a longitudinal section here. And as I mentioned, the fact that there's no nucleus, there's very little in the way of the ability of a sieve tube to be able, sieve tube element to be able to regulate its metabolism. Um, it's in association, each sieve tube element has a companion cell, which is a, a type of parenchyma cell that has a nucleus and all the other organelles of the plant cell. And it regulates, it helps to regulate the metabolism of the adjoining sieve tube element, which is alive but lacking in some really critical um, parts of its cell. And actually the companion cell and the sieve tube element are formed from the same uh, initial cell. There's a cell division that results in a companion cell and a sieve tube element. So they're developmentally conjoined. They actually come from a common ancestral cell that divides. Um, and so if uh, the interesting thing about the sieve plate, we'll talk about it later, is if um, these are really precious substances that the plant's moving through here, the sugars. So if there's any wounding of this, if the, there's a breach of the sieve tube, it behooves the plant to seal this up immediately. And it does, in fact, it seals it up so quickly that it's really hard to study the anatomy of these cells because this substance called callos is 
formed instantaneously that seals up the sieve plate holes here and prevents any further conduction. So um, these, these have really good wound response to keep from losing sugars. Are there questions about xylem or phloem at this point? We're going to get into it more later. Okay, so we're out of time, and we'll just talk about the way these are organized and get to the other systems shortly.